How much math do engineers actually use in their career? It's a good question since engineers take a lot of math in school. And I'll give you an answer. Not a whole lot. While I may bump shoulders with the odd integral or even fraternize with the occasional partial derivative, most of the complex math that you learn in college is done by computers. Now what exactly that all means and how it all works is what I'm going to try and explain in this video because I still think it's important to understand these concepts and how they're applied. First, let's go over all the math that most engineers learn. Calc 1, 2, and 3, linear algebra, statistics, differential equations, partial differential equations, and at least one numerical methods course. That's, that's a lot of math. Most of the day-to-day -day math that you'll be doing is likely going to be a lot simpler, and I'll give you an example. One of my previous jobs, I worked with production packers. Packers are pretty common tools that are used to complete oil wells, and their job is to basically create a seal between the casing and the tubing. And the purpose of this is to direct the oil up through the tubing and not through the casing. And this also helps protect the casing and sort of isolate it. You set the packer by basically compressing an element so that it expands up to the casing. Now, one thing we always needed to figure out was what was going to be the total stroke of the packer. In other words, how much is is the packer going to move? How much is this outer sleeve going to displace by the time that it reaches its final position? This is important for a few reasons, but one of them was to ensure that we had enough ratchet engagement. The ratchet and the ratchet ring hold the seal in place once the force is released. So we don't want to end up over here, let's say, where there's no more engagement. We get different elements that were different materials, different sizes, different size packers, different size casings. The stroke could be different for each, you know, each situation. But again, yeah, it's, it's nothing, you know, basic volume calculations. We'd use algebra when we're calculating stresses, say the stresses on the packer. Um, but again, yeah, nothing, nothing too complex. Now, one of the problems with these packers is that the seals end up wearing out over time and you have to replace them. So we came up with a potential solution, which was to add a spring, which would help continuously energize the packer. The spring was just a regular piece of pipe with a bunch of slots milled in it. The idea being that this would make it more flexible so that we could deform it like a spring. It would sit right above the element and continuously push on it so that it can maintain its seal. Now, this is not an easy design. How do you take this very stiff piece of pipe and remove enough material so that it can behave like a spring without weakening it too much where it would just buckle or yield when you load it? Well, you have to use computers, and in our case, finite element analysis. Efficient Engineer has an excellent video on the finite element method. I urge you guys to go and watch it. But basically, once you create your geometry and define your conditions and create your mesh and so on, the software is going to solve for your outputs. In this case, for our stresses and displacements. And it does this using linear algebra, differential equations, and other types of math. So yeah, you don't actually have to solve for these outputs. You don't have to do any of that math. The computer does all that. CFD is another example. It's something you'll likely see in your career. Say you're trying to solve for the drag over a wing, maybe the, I don't know, pressure loss in a heating system or something. You're typically looking to solve for velocity fields, maybe pressure fields, but you don't actually compute these values or these, these gradients. The software does. And it does this using the Navier-Stokes equations. So you learn about these equations, but you don't actually solve them. Your job as the engineer is to make sure you give the software the right inputs, you select the right boundary conditions, you create the right mesh, you tell it how to solve it, as in, say, is the flow turbulent or is it laminar? Is it compressible or is it incompressible? Which module to use? And finally, you need to verify that what it's giving you actually makes sense. Because the software just does what you tell it to. That's why I think math is important to learn and to understand. It's to, it's, it helps you understand how all these, everything is being calculated a bit better so that you can better verify the solutions and stuff. Let's go over a couple more examples. In Stephen Strogatz's book, Infinite Powers, he describes a really cool story about how John Glenn, the first American to orbit Earth, was brought home safely with the help of calculus. In order to have a successful return, John needed to both enter Earth's atmosphere at the right angle and land at the exact correct destination. If he landed too far away from his target, he might drown before anyone could reach him. Now, he doesn't explain how calculus is actually used, so I'm gonna take my best shot here, but there are definitely differential equations involved, so I think it's a good example. So, typically with space missions, you launch and land in the same place. So let's say you launch at Cape Canaveral, you land nearby in the Atlantic Ocean, or maybe even on the KSC runway, if, say, you're the shuttle. Everything is carefully planned out. Your launch trajectory, your orbit, deorbit, re-entry, landing, and you need to map out your location at all times, or what your position will be as a function of time. Let's just focus on re-entry here. 
the speed that you're orbiting Earth, or your orbital speed, is dictated by your orbit. Different orbit, different speed. And so your re-entry path is going to be different for each mission. And so the question becomes this, at what point and at what angle must you re-enter in order to land at your target? Let's go back to high school. <laughs> in beginner physics, you learn about projectile motion, right? So say you launch a ball at some angle with some velocity, you're asked to figure out how far it'll travel, how high it'll go, how much time it's in the air, and so on. These equations should look a little familiar. They're one of the first ones that you learn in physics. Our problem is quite similar. Instead of launching from the ground, we're just launching from some height. If you know your angle, your speed, and your height, then you can solve these equations and figure out where you're going to land. And you can almost think of a rocket like a projectile. You can't land and maneuver a rocket like you can a plane. So you've basically got one shot to get this all right. And unfortunately, of course, our problem is a little more complicated than what I've shown here. There are other factors that need to be accounted for. For one, you've got air resistance, which is the main mechanism that spacecrafts use to slow down. It also limits the angles at which you can enter. Orbital speeds are insane. And if you come down too steep, you'll burn up. You come in too shallow, and you'll end up somewhere way over where you don't want to be. So really, you've got a window of just a few, maybe even a couple degrees that you can actually enter. Once you're in, then your goal is just to use this air drag to lose as much speed as you can so that you can land safely at your target. Now, how do we figure out our trajectory? Well, these equations of motion are actually derived from a force balance. It's kind of cool. If you have a body in free fall and you ignore drag, the only force acting on it is gravity. Since acceleration is just the time derivative of velocity, you can rewrite it like this. And look, this, this is a differential equation. You start starting to see it. Cancel the masses, integrate, and you get velocity equals gravity times time plus some initial velocity. Integrate again, and you get your position equation that we're familiar with. Now, what happens when you add drag to the equation? You get a drag force that opposes your direction of motion. And drag force, it's not a constant like gravity. It's a function of your velocity. In fact, it increases with the square of your velocity. So now you got something where your acceleration depends on your velocity, which depends on your drag, and you're trying to solve for your position. This is a differential equation. This is what they're used for. And there is a solution to this that I just pulled from NASA's website. And there you have it. We've got a function that'll tell us our position at all times. We can plan out our entire trajectory. Problem solved, right? No, <laughs> hey, just hang with me. We're almost, we're getting there. Remember, we're still going really fast, right? So just like before, we have to adjust our trajectory so that the stress and the heat that's acting on the body doesn't exceed its limits. So if this is our theoretical trajectory, we're probably going to look something similar to what I've, I've drawn here. We've also got lift that's going to act on the body. We have an air density that changes quite a bit with altitude. So when you're calculating your drag, you can't take density as a constant. You have to treat it as its own function. And also, we usually do these problems assuming a constant mass, but a rocket's mass is not constant. Rockets generate thrust by expelling propellant. So they're constantly losing mass. In addition, they jettison tanks, engines, payload, their heat shields melt away. Sometimes retro rockets are even used for landing as SpaceX has been doing with their reusables. So when you're doing all this, you actually have to solve for the rocket's change in momentum, not just its change in velocity. And look, this is the extent of my knowledge of orbital mechanics or all this trajectory stuff. There's way, way more to this, but the point is not to try and solve these equations. It's to show that math and how math is used to solve these types of problems. But they are solvable since the mission was a success. In fact, this was actually the first time that NASA had used computers for their calculations. And the story goes that Glenn wouldn't proceed with the mission until Katherine Johnson, a well-known mathematician at NASA, verified the calculations herself. She did, she was right, and the mission, like I said, was a success. Pretty cool story, I think. The book covers examples of math use in all sorts of industries, not just mechanical, so I think it's a worthwhile read. 3 Blue on Brown has some really good videos on math, so does Zach Starr, so check them out as well. So in summary, math is used pretty much everywhere. You'll definitely use it in your career. You probably won't be doing the rigorous, complex math that you do in school. That's mostly done by computers, but it's still a good idea, I think, to have a good understanding of how it all works. I'll help you really understand what... Um, what the software is giving you, whether or not it's it's kind of accurate. It's good to know how it's getting these solutions so that you can help verify them. Thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll probably be doing a uh, Q&A next video. 
keep it chill, keep it, uh, put something out quickly instead of six weeks. So love you guys. See y'all next time.